Question. Who came up with the alphabet in the first place? No single person, people, or culture invented the alphabet all by themselves. It slowly evolved over hundreds of years. In order to understand, we have to go back more than 5,000 years to Egypt. The ancient Egyptians wrote using a kind of alphabet called hieroglyphics, which were single pictures that represented entire words or ideas. This meant that the Egyptians had thousands of different hieroglyphs representing all sorts of things. As you might imagine, it wasn't easy for people to memorize all those unique symbols, so only the most wealthy and influential people in society had the money, time, or energy needed to learn them. A couple thousand years later, sometime between 1850 and 1700 BC, the most common Egyptian hieroglyphs were adapted, simplified, and spread by merchants to make trading simpler. This alphabet had 22 letters in it and was much simpler for sailors and merchants to memorize. This alphabet, also called Abjad, is the foundation for most of our modern alphabets. By 800 BC, the Abjad system had spread to Greece, where it was refined and adjusted to serve the Greek language. This was the first alphabet to call each symbol a letter and represented a specific sound. That meant, for the first time, someone could read and write the language without any confusion as to how it's supposed to sound. At first, Greek was written right to left, then serpentine style, right to left, then left to right, back and forth. Finally, around 500 BC, it changed to the pattern we mostly use now, left to right. This Greek alphabet is the foundation for most of our alphabets today, including Latin, which led to English, Spanish, and French, and Cyrillic, which led to modern Russian. Who invented school? It's probably no surprise to learn that schools are nothing new. The oldest known schools date back thousands of years to ancient cultures like China, Greece, and India. But even before that, people still needed to teach their kids about the world. Ancient man taught their young very much the same way that animals do, by elders teaching youngsters how to survive. But as time passed and society grew more complex, people saw the need for education centers, where a few well-trained adults could teach a group of kids all kinds of info, maybe even things their parents didn't know. Schools got better, but didn't change much over the next thousand years or so, until around the late 1600s. This was the beginning of a period called the Age of Enlightenment when people started stressing the importance of discovery and education. These Enlightenment ideas were super popular in the original 13 colonies, and in 1647, Massachusetts became the first colony to require that towns set up a school for their kids. But most of the credit for our modern American school life is given to a guy named Horace Mann. He was the Secretary of Education in Massachusetts in the early 1800s. Horace traveled to a place called Prussia, which is part of modern-day Germany. While there, he was impressed by the Prussian education system, which had professional teachers, funding to build state-of-the-art schools, and common subjects taught all across the country. Their system was much more efficient, so Horace decided to use it in Massachusetts. And before long, tons of other states started using the Prussian system too. More states started to require school attendance, and by 1918, our modern public school system was in place across the country. So next time you need to take a test, remember to thank Horace Mann. Do you actually have a permanent record? The threat of a permanent record that documents every misdeed you ever did is enough to scare any student. Will every teacher I ever have get a copy and read it over? Will it affect college? Jobs? Ready for the good news? No, it won't. According to the U.S. Department of Education, records do technically exist for every student, but they're nothing like we picture them. These records are really just chock full of super boring info, forms, and documents. Things like contact info, address, health records, blah, 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 blah. In other words, there's definitely plenty of information about you, but there's also not just a list of all the bad things you've done. So now we've established that there are, in fact, records, but how permanent are they? 
Well, not permanent at all. By law, schools aren't required to keep a student's records after they graduate. Some states tell schools to keep them for a certain amount of time, but ultimately, they all get destroyed to make space for new records. So, if you ever pranked a teacher in first grade and are worried it'll haunt you for the rest of your life, don't worry, the evidence will be shredded. Who's the cruel, cruel person who invented homework? In the past, getting an education was nothing like we picture it today. No chalkboards, no recess, no assemblies or pizza parties. Even no schoolhouses. That's right. For most of history, children would receive their schooling at home, and only the rich and powerful could afford to educate their kids. That's because most families were way too busy farming, working, and just trying to get by, and the kids needed to help. Rich families and lords would pay tutors to come to their home to teach their kids. Back then, kids weren't getting homework. If you think about it, it's kind of hard to assign a kid homework when the whole thing is happening at home. So, when did homework become the never-ending nightly nightmare we know it as today? It was in the 1950s that things started to change and homework finally reared its ugly head. At the time, the US was competing with the Soviet Union and tried to get any competitive edge they could find. One of the ways they wanted to get the upper hand was by raising smarter kids. Teachers and school districts were encouraged to assign more homework so that American students would outcompete their Soviet counterparts parts and grow up to be scientists and engineers. And by the 1950s, less families needed their kids to stay at home and work the fields. So there wasn't a huge outcry from parents once the assignments started rolling in. Where does summer vacation come from and why do we have it in the summer? Some people think that in the 1800s, schools started closing for the summer so that kids would have time to work on their family's farm. It sounds like a logical reason, but it's actually not true. In reality, we can thank sweaty city kids for our summer vacation. In the mid-1800s, American cities grew bigger and bigger as more and more people flocked to them. All those people, buildings, and concrete raised the temperature, which made cities unbearably hot. The heat led many wealthy families to escape the city and spend their summers in the cooler countryside. It might be hard to believe today, but school attendance was optional in those days, so many city classrooms would be almost empty in the summer. As school attendance in the summertime began to dwindle, some politicians argued that kids should get the summer off anyway. At the time, most people believed that the brain was a muscle, and if it was used too much, you could injure it like any other muscle. This was not true, but it did help convince people that kids should have time off to relax from the stress of school. By 1900, most urban schools around the country were taking the summer off, and rural schools eventually followed suit. So, this summer, while you're building sandcastles at the beach, you can thank your heroic great-great-great-grandparents for skipping school so much they literally had to give us the whole summer off. Who actually invented the two magical days we call the weekend? We might take our weekends for granted these days, but did you know they've been around for less than 100 years? That's right, it wasn't until the late 1800s that the idea of a two-day weekend was first considered. This was during a period known as the Industrial Revolution, when jobs started shifting away from traditional farming and agricultural work and towards jobs in large factories. Many workers were unhappy with their new jobs since the factories had them working long hours every day and sometimes even forced them to work seven days a week. As more and more workers complained about the terrible conditions, organized labor strikes formed across the U.S. But it wasn't just strikes that led to the invention of the weekend. Many Jewish and Christian workers would ask for Saturdays or Sundays off in order to rest for the traditional day of worship. Over time, owners realized it would be easier to let workers off on both Saturday and Sunday. So that's where the idea started. But one man in particular was responsible for turning the weekend into an official part of the work week. The man behind Ford Motor Company played a big role in creating our weekend. Ford began giving his factory workers a two-day weekend in the early 1900s. Why did Henry Ford decide to do this? Why, for cynical business reasons, of course. He realized that some of his best customers were his employees. So, if he wanted to sell more cars, he decided his factory workers needed time off each week to enjoy them. It wasn't until 1938 that the federal government jumped on board, limiting companies to the 40-hour work week that we still have today. So, the next time you're lounging on the weekend, you can thank labor unions, religion, and Henry Ford 
for understanding that everyone's happier if people have a couple of days off each week to buy things and enjoy life. What is the absolute hardest instrument to learn? There are two main ways that an instrument can be hard for someone to pick up. Some can be hard to play, and some can be hard to learn. Lots are hard to play because they take tons and tons of practice. People who master piano have to play for thousands of hours before they get really good. That's hard. There are lots of instruments that take plenty of practice. The harp, flute, piano, and guitar, just to name a few. But others are hard to play because, well, they're literally hard to play. Take a tuba, for example. That big honking brass behemoth takes lots of muscle and lung power to play. Bagpipes, French horns, accordions, and drum kits all take plenty of physical skill to play well. Okay, so that's why some instruments are harder to play than others, but which one is the hardest? Well, the truth is, no one can say for sure. Some think the mighty bagpipes are the hardest, while others say the little piccolo. Some say the French horn, and others point to the giant drum kit. But most music experts agree that maybe the single hardest instrument to learn today is a drum roll, please. The violin. What makes the violin so hard to play? Well, lots of things. For starters, you have to keep it firm and balanced under your chin while keeping perfect posture, leaving your left hand free to move up and down the strings. On top of that, a violin doesn't have frets like a guitar, so it's much harder to know exactly where to put your fingers on the string to get the right note. And on the violin, Getting your fingertips in just the right spot is key, and master violinists need to get it perfect just about every time. As you might imagine, that takes tons of time, practice, patience, and putting up with bad playing until you finally start to figure it out. In other words, it's not for the faint of heart. But don't let that stop you. It might be hard, it might be frustrating at first, but if you put in enough effort and make sure to practice, anyone can learn how to play any of the hardest instruments out there, even the violin. Just maybe wait until high school for the tuba. You don't want to pass out in the middle of band class.